every week, so much happens in your own country that it's hard to keep track of the news at home, let alone what's going on around the world. So the Global Summary is our weekly rundown of the week's biggest news events from all across the globe. In the next eight minutes, I'm going to walk you through some of the biggest news stories, but we'll be moving fast. So if you want to find out more about any of the stories, then there are article recommendations in the description. This week's biggest stories include Iran's claims regarding nuclear terrorism, India and Nepal's forest fires, and scepticism surrounding China's vaccines. Before we start though, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and ring the bell to be notified every time we put out a new global news video. A bunch of you haven't made the jump and subscribed yet, so we'd really appreciate your support. On Sunday, Iran experienced a blackout at their main uranium enrichment facility, in what the head of Iran's atomic energy agency described as an act of nuclear terrorism, going on to say that the perpetrators intended to prevent our nuclear industry's development. He went on to remark that to thwart the goals of those who have engineered this terrorist act, the Islamic Republic of Iran will continue to seriously develop nuclear technologies on one hand and expand its efforts to lift the unjust sanctions on the other hand. Initially, the nuclear head didn't name a specific country, but many have speculated and even accused that the blackout could have been caused by Israel because the two are widely understood to have targeted each other using cyber attacks in the past. The timing of this blackout also can't be underestimated, with Iran re-entering talks with the US last Tuesday. Following Trump's withdrawal from the deal, Biden's new administration are keen for the US to realign with the international community on the issue, saying that they'd lift sanctions if Tehran come back into compliance with the deal. Let's move east to India, where many onlookers grew concerned in the last couple of days to see major events still taking place despite worrying COVID case numbers. Following a horrifying second wave, India has recently overtaken Brazil as the country with the second highest case count in the world, only behind the United States. Despite this, tens of thousands of people headed to the River Ganges this weekend to conduct the bathing day traditions of Kumbh Mela. Kumbh Mela takes place every 12 years, and maybe the rareness of the event was enough to make some people still want to attend, despite the country reporting 168,000 new cases of COVID on the same day. Health experts did call for the event's cancellation, but the government allowed the event to continue, saying that health measures would be followed. Also, maybe they were put off banning the event because doing so would be challenging, but it's a worrying sight in a country already struggling with the outbreak. Let's turn to Germany now, where the race to secede from Chancellor Angela Merkel is hotting up even further. To understand this story fully, let me give you a little context. Later this year, Germany is holding a federal election, which will result in a new chancellor being elected. The country's current chancellor, Angela Merkel, is stepping down, which means that her party, the CDU, needs to select a new candidate. What makes Germany a bit different from other countries is that the party's leader isn't necessarily the party's candidate for chancellor. So the parties aren't obliged to put forward their leader in the election and could instead select another candidate for the position of chancellor. This puts the CDU in a slightly difficult position. Their leader, Armin Laschet, isn't that popular, with polling results dropping significantly and many suggesting that he failed in the recent elections. So there's some doubt that the party want to select him as their candidate. What makes things even more complicated is the CDU actually have a sister party, the CSU, and together they normally pick candidates. Ordinarily, as the larger party, the CDU's leader gets to rule, but this year, the CSU's leader, Marcus Suda, has thrown his hat in the ring. In his announcement, he said that he never intended to run, but if he didn't, then he would be ducking his responsibility. And this makes things more difficult for the CDU, and lash it more specifically. With the CDU falling in polling, this new option could see the tides turn, something they desperately need in an important election like this. Ultimately, we'll keep you updated in the future weeks as to how this plays out. Speaking of elections, Guillermo Lasso has been elected as Ecuador's president, 
with the conservative ex-banker marking a clear shift from the country's more left-wing past. Securing 52.5% of the vote, Lasso's vision for the country's future clearly resonated with voters, with him accepting the challenge of changing our country's destiny. These changes are expected to include Lasso steering the country away from leftist policy, which he said has dragged down the country, instead promising to attract foreign investment, create 2 million new jobs, and increase oil production. If he's successful, and if Ecuadorians will be satisfied with the results, well, that's yet to be seen. Now, in a sentence that certainly isn't fun to say, let's quickly run through three natural disasters. One in St. Vincent, one in Western Australia, and one in India and Nepal. On Friday, a major volcano in St. Vincent erupted, blasting tons of ash all over the island, forcing more than 16,000 people to evacuate. These eruptions continued over the weekend, leading to further power and water outages. Further eruptions are expected, which could make life even more difficult for an island already being described as a battle zone by emergency officials. Western Australia faced a cyclone this weekend, with the Category 3 storm tearing across more than a thousand kilometres of land and destroying property and downing power. Officials have said that it's too soon to assess the full impact and extent of the damage, but luckily with storms calming, communities will soon be able to come back together and begin to recover. Then in India and Nepal, there have been some serious fires raging near the border for several weeks. Despite efforts to put out the flames, the blaze, which is the worst seen in over 15 years, continues emitting over 18,000 megatons of carbon each month. In fact, last month about 500 forest fires were recorded in Nepal, with air quality dropping to hazardous levels for several days. Over the last week, China has been in the spotlight for their domestically produced vaccines, with some calling into question their efficacy. In fact, it's not just foreign detractors, because in a rare admission of weakness, the head of the Chinese Centers for Disease Control and Prevention remarked that the current vaccines don't have very high rates of protection, going on to suggest mixing vaccines to up the efficacy. It seems that he backtracked on these comments in the following hours, but initial international test data does suggest that the vaccines produced in China aren't all that effective. For example, Brazilian trials of Sinovac found it to be only 50.4% effective, only barely surpassing the requirement for approval by the WHO. While trials from Turkey and Indonesia provided some more promising results, between 65 and 91% efficacy, it does seem that China's vaccines might not be as effective as their international equivalents. Ultimately though, we just need more time and more trials. Finally, let's look at a story which involves China, the EU, Montenegro and a bridge. In 2014, Montenegro took out a $1 billion loan with a Chinese bank in order to fund 85% of a bridge being built by the Chinese Road and Bridge Corporation in Montenegro. At the time, this might have seemed like a good decision, with this very expensive bridge helping to better connect the country to their neighbours. However, today they might be regretting the call, with them asking the EU for support in order to pay off the loan. Montenegro, interestingly, isn't actually part of the EU, although they are hoping to join. So you might wonder why the EU would even want to help with Montenegro's finances. Well, the EU's growing increasingly concerned about China's influence both within their bloc and at their borders, with a recent report remarking that China's on the cusp of acquiring real leverage over policy choices, political attitudes and narratives in some parts of the Western Balkans. As such, the EU may be willing to lend a hand to prevent China from getting too much leverage and control in the Baltic state. However, one EU official has suggested that this might not be possible due to the size of the loan, remarking that if an agreement were to be reached, Montenegro would need to commit to fiscal reforms first. So those were some of the biggest global news stories from the last week. And if 8 minutes wasn't enough for you, then there's links to further reading in the description.
If you think we missed anything, then comment below the stories you'd like to see us cover in future episodes. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and ring the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.